Welcome back to Pharmacology. In this block, we'll speak a bit about things to think about when you're reviewing the medical literature, particularly as it relates to making decisions about pharmacotherapy. We'll, we'll review a couple of content areas here. One, we'll talk about why papers are rejected from publication, uh, which often tells us a lot about uh, what we ought to be looking for or what we'll see in what's published. We'll look also at how you find the information you're looking to find if you're looking for a particular article. We'll talk about the who, what, when, where, whys, and methodology of studies. We'll briefly talk about the concept of pharmacoeconomic evaluations and some of the pitfalls with that. And finally, a little bit about applying uh, the literature that you find to your clinical practice. So there was a great series of articles in the late 1990s that really stand the test of time by Greenhall uh, regarding uh, published in British Medical Journal about how to read papers, uh, medical journals. And much of this has not really changed over the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, it, but why papers have been rejected for publication uh, is true today as, as likely as it was true 20, 30 years ago is that the study that was done didn't address an important scientific issue or it wasn't original data, that the authors might have had a hypothesis but what they tested didn't represent that hypothesis, or the study design was wrong, there was something that was compromised or with bias, the sample size might have been small, or there weren't adequate controls in the study uh, to uh, render it uh, an effective study, or they applied statistics incorrectly Maybe the authors drew unjustified conclusions from data, there were conflicts of interest, or they were poorly written. In clinical practice, we rely on both these primary literature reviews, the original studies, uh, as well as some secondary reviews, for example, meta-analyses, or uh, even secondary to tertiary reviews, uh, which would be published data uh, for publications and reference materials. When you're looking to find an original article, there are a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, one of the most common ways now is just do a Google search or a Bing search, whatever your search engine is, and a lot will show up. But the question is, is whether or not you're getting to the original data or not, and whether or not you have access to it. If you have the feasibility of working with an, uh, on a lab medical librarian or a librarian who's familiar with online resources, they could probably guide you in that half hour or hour they spend with you about how to really access uh, those resources well. The Ovid is probably the most comprehensive database that's been used for a generation or so. Uh, PubMed uh, is also a, a way to get access to some data. There are also journal ad, uh, abstracting services like Journal Watch from the New England Journal uh, that would abstract uh, the top 10, 20, 50, 100 journals in your area of interest uh, to, to give you a quick abstract of what's critical coming out of those. The other thing you could do is if there's a new article or something that's interesting to you or you, you're you kind of pinpointing it, you can look at their references to see what they referenced and those might serve as articles although they get a little dated. Uh, otherwise, you just kind of look around and hunt and pecking and sooner or later you find what, you're, what you might be looking for. But in this day and age, the search engine is probably the, the way that you're going to initially get introduced to find what you're looking for. So let's look at a few critical questions as relates to methodology and studies, because you're going to be in a position where you may be faced with a journal article, and then you're in a position to decide, well, how does this influence my prescribing pattern? Um, so some of the questions you're going to, uh, that you should look at when you see a study is, why was it conducted? Uh, what was the clinical question? Was it clinically important? Is it logical? Is it meaningful to the patients I see? Also important, who conducted the study? Were the folks who conducted it, were they experienced and credentialed? Were they independent? One question always to look at is who paid for the study? Who funded it? What are the affiliations of the people who did the study? All of these factors can have an impact on whether or not you are concerned that there might be uh, portions of this study or the study itself may be invalid or uh, call some cr uh, credibility into question. You also want to look at where was it studied, 
Uh, where was the study conducted? Uh, was it done in the United States or overseas? Was it done in one center or a multi-center? Was it inpatient or outpatient? And those have impact on the ability for you to generalize the results of the study you're having to the patient who's in front of you. If, for example, it was done in an inpatient setting where there might have been a lot of supports for those patients uh, and, your, and your patient is an outpatient who may not have those same supports, the question gets called to mind is, was the outcome that achieved in the study related at all to the support the patient had in that controlled environment uh, versus the intervention that they gave? <clears throat> You also want to look at where the study was published. Was it a peer-reviewed journal uh, or was it a journal that we, we kind of uh, look at uh, in clinical practice as a throwaway journal, a journal in which there's a lot of advertising and uh, there is less rigorous uh, uh, evaluation by the editors uh, before they publish a particular study. You also want to know the methodology and what phase of the study. Is it an animal model study for which we don't have a lot of clinical utility for that animal data? Uh, but for human studies, was it a phase one, two, three, or four study? We talked about this uh, earlier in the legal block. You want to look at the methodology. Was it primary or secondary? Primary experiments, clinical trials, a survey. That was the actual data. They present all of the data versus secondary uh, evaluations, which are re reviews or systematic overviews, meta-analyses or guidelines, decision analysis, where they compile perhaps multiple primary uh, references. And the advantage of a secondary reference is that you get a more breadth of the issue. But the problem with a secondary or a potential problem with a secondary study is if they don't do their methodology correctly, you're relying on the people who did that secondary analysis that they were really competent to capture the primary literature well and accurately. Classically, uh, the, the, the type of primary reference were uh, considered the highest level or the best of the randomized control trials. The advantages are that they uh, randomize everything uh, and select a, hopefully an outcome that's meaningful and then the only difference between group A and group B was the intervention. Everything else that could affect the outcome they were measuring were identical or hopefully were identical. <clears throat> so the advantage is that this answers the question, is drug A better than drug B? Uh, it's often done in a rigorous prospective way, uh, which is the strongest prospective, much more strong than a retrospective analysis. Uh, and they reduce bias by comparing two otherwise identical groups. It also allows for the randomized trials, if they're done well and they're very explicit with their inclusion and exclusion criteria, then they can later be incorporated into a meta-analysis. The disadvantage of randomized trials are they're expensive, they're time-consuming, and because they're so expensive and time-consuming, the studies may have only a small number of patients in them or the study may not be have conducted for a long enough period of time. So all of these are variables uh, that are important in a randomized trial. Uh, other concern or potential disadvantage is that because they're so expensive, they're often not conducted except by someone who has a financial interest in the outcome of that study, i.e. the pharmaceutical company. So you're always going to be in a position where you want to evaluate what biases there are or potential biases there are when you're looking at uh, any study that's done, who conducted it, and where was it funded, how was it funded. There are also cohort studies. Cohort studies are uh, ideal for answering a question of looking at the effect of an exposure and going back in time. Uh, but the problem, or, or moving ahead in time, uh, but the problem is that they are due to bias related to natural selection. <clears throat> so you look at folks who had the exposure, uh, or disease progression over time, uh, but you might be biased by who you end up seeing uh, in that process. Advantages of case control studies are they're ideal to look at very rare conditions, and these go back in time. They're retrospective as opposed to uh, what we just talked about. Uh, they're usually inexpensive to do, but they are influenced by uh, what constitutes a case. Cross-sectional analyses are, have an advantage of, in that they're 
I, uh, they're ideal to evaluate an incidence or a prevalence of a condition. They're easy to conduct. They're not time consuming. They're inexpensive. Uh, but again, they rely on retrospective data. And retrospective analysis compared to prospective. Retrospective always less expensive, easy to do. You can do it by looking at medical review and or interviewing patients. But it relies on what gets documented and what the memory of that patient is, both of which have clear flaws compared to when you prospectively want to write down everything and you structure the assessments in advance. Those are always stronger by their nature. One of the weakest kinds of publications are case reports. They play an important role, but basically what happens is that a clinician will report on something unusual that they observe. That's typically what's seen. They're very quick and inexpensive to do, but they're very biased because you can't really control for whether the outcome you're seeing is at all related to any intervention. There's nothing to control for, and so we call that a bias or an N of one. Uh, and the, in clinical practice, we can also experience the same kind of bias. So for example, you could have 100 patients on uh, one of these statin drugs, for example, to lower cholesterol, but if your one patient goes in, one of your patients has a rare event and goes into renal failure with rhabdomyolysis, you may take that one case report and have it overly influence your decision making in future cases. So uh, we're, we're careful about how much weight we give a case report. The hierarchy of the strongest designs, if they're designed well, are systematic reviews and meta-analysis provide the strongest amount of, uh, the strongest level of data for us. Now, systematic reviews and meta-analyses compile uh, clinical trial data typically uh, from multiple trials, and so they are powered enough, they have enough patients involved to answer an important clinical question. The issue is that that meta-analysis or that uh, systematic review has to be structured in a way that really confirms uh, that they have matched apples to apples, meaning all of the patients they included from study A, B, C, D, and E all had similar inclusion and exclusion criteria that they manipulated the data in a way that was appropriate to do. And it really takes a specialist in statistics and study design uh, to well design a meta-analysis. So most of the hierarchy, high-level journals, New England Journal, uh, British Medical Journal, Lancet, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, uh, the journals that are considered the top tier types of journals typically will have someone on their editorial board who looks at the methodology that was done within the study they get before they publish it and evaluate it pretty carefully as well. So it's kind of had a double set of eyes looking at it. Randomized control trials with definitive results are the next strongest, and then randomized control trials with less than definitive results uh, on the way down, all the way down through the grouping here to ultimately case reports that are among the weakest of study designs. So as you're looking at methodology and you're looking at your patient selection, particularly if it's a randomized trial, you may want to look at was, were the two groups evenly matched, were the intervention group and the placebo or, or the alternate treatment group uh, identical in all of the factors that would affect the outcome. So for example, if you were looking at rates of heart attack with treatment A versus treatment B, typically in the study they will have a table, usually it's table one in most randomized studies, that will compare all the folks who got the treatment A versus all the folks who got treatment B on factors such as their rates of diabetes, their hemoglobin A1C level, their mean blood pressure control, the number of antihypertensives they were on, uh, their chronic renal disease that they've already had or not, how many were men, how many were women, how many were, uh, what was their body surface area, uh, uh, body mass index, uh, you know, how many were obese or not. And if their outcome was heart attacks, then anything that could conceivably affect the rates of heart attacks should be identical in both groups. So if they've randomized their selection of who gets drug and who A and who gets drug B, then those should end up being equal. 
particularly if the study size was large enough just by pure chance. If, however, that treatment B had many more patients who had hypertension and hyperlipidemia and diabetes and, and they also had more heart attacks at the end of the study, then you can ask the question, did the, was the reason why they had more heart attacks related to the drugs or was it related to these other comorbidities that were a factor for them? So important to consider those variables. You also want to look at any confounding variables. You want to look at, uh, is it represent, did they select people who are representative of who we're going to treat? For example, if they had all young adults, but typically it's a rheumatoid arthritis drug for which you're going to usually see older patients and they were not included, then that might have a problem for you to generalize those results to someone who weighs, who, who's in their 60s or 70s when they had only young patients in the study. Did their inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria uh, make sense? Were they objective? So we included in the study everybody with these conditions. Uh, we excluded anybody who had a prior stroke. We excluded anybody who had a prior whatever. Uh, did those make sense for what they were looking for? Also important for you to evaluate whether or not they studied it in an ideal or a real life circumstance. If, for example, you were looking at the effect of a uh, drug intervention on preventing relapse for people with a history of alcohol abuse, and they were studying it in a highly uh, controlled residential setting compared treatment A to treatment B in a highly controlled residential setting, you probably can't generalize those results to someone who is in ambulatory practice and living on their own and not in a rehab setting. So important that you are able to look at the kind of circumstances they control the study in. And for case control studies, did they define what they constitute, what constituted a case? When you look at outcomes, the question was the, was the question appropriate and accurate? Uh, was the assessment method clearly defined? Uh, did the outcome measures make sense clinic and are they clinically significant? Was it a surrogate or endpoint or a meaningful endpoint? Now, what do we mean by that? A surrogate endpoint is an endpoint that is a mid-range kind of or a mid-level kind of outcome that doesn't necessarily mean something clinically, as opposed to a clinically meaningful outcome does. An example, if you're concerned about a drug and its ability to reduce heart attacks and deaths, then a meaningful outcome are heart attacks and deaths. If, however, your, your study only looked at cholesterol levels and blood pressure, cholesterol level is a surrogate outcome. A lab value is a surrogate outcome. A blood pressure, a temperature is a surrogate outcome, meaning we think those that the blood pressure and the cholesterol are correlated ultimately with the disease, heart attack, or death, but we don't definitively know that. And so always important in clinical medicine when you're looking at studies, it's more important to look at the effect of a drug on a meaningful clinical outcome than on one of these surrogate outcomes, the effect on a lab value or a, a physical finding or something like that. You also want to know was the measurement uh, objective that they looked at for outcomes? Who made the observation? Were they blinded? Were they standardized? How often were the observations made? You're looking for anything that could explain bias, anything that could have unduly influenced the outcomes in group A or B. Was there something that rendered it, that another explanation for that outcome other than the true intervention, that difference between intervention A and intervention B? The time frame prospective, as we alluded to, looking forward is always the strongest design. Because in advance, you decide a priori, in advance, you decide what you're going to look at, how you're going to look at it, and what you define as success or failure. As opposed to retrospective, looking backwards, you rely also on memory, which, if it's anything like my memory, can be pretty awful. Um, so a patient may not remember things fully well. Also, things don't always make it into the medical record. If you're doing a medical record review of things, not everything gets charted or appropriate. So retrospective designs, by their very nature, have inherent weakness in them. The other question you have was the treatment intervention blind. 
Uh, did they use placebos? If they did, how did they describe them? Uh, was there something about the treatment of treatment A that that anyone who took treatment A would know it was treatment A versus treatment B? Did the treatment have a side effect or a property in the tablet or a taste or something that that in a sense unblinded the study? Blinding is when you are looking at either the uh, the observer of the outcome and or the patient who's affected, usually both, double blind is both are blinded, uh, don't know whether they got treatment A or treatment B or treatment A or placebo. But sometimes the side effects of the drug itself lend that to people to figure that out. When I've worked in hospital settings before with investigational drug services, it'd be very common that a nurse would approach us and say, uh, I know the patient got the active drug because their blood pressure dropped a lot 20 minutes after we gave the drug. So they, they kind of, in a sense, it's hard to blind that because you observe an effect that you see in a patient that's predictable by the drug you're giving, which is different than the alternate control thing you're looking at. Sometimes it's a little more subtle. Uh, when a farm, as a pharmacy uh, in a hospital that prepares drugs for investigational use, typically we'd make in the intravenous drugs at least, would make them in the IV room. And the, the active drug compared to the placebo, the active drug may foam up on reconstitution where the placebo doesn't foam up. So if the product is foamy when you're making it, by its very nature, you've unblinded the study. Somebody knows what's, uh, which is drug and which is control. Other things you're looking at is, uh, and important issues, does the dose regimen make sense? So are you comparing appropriately treatment A to treatment B? Uh, are you looking at an appropriate dose? Is the regimen a first-line intervention for that condition? Let me share with you an example. Uh, uh, many years ago, there was a drug that the FDA approved uh, based on one study. It was called Felbamate. Felbamate is an anti-epileptic drug. And they won, partly won FDA approval based on one study, which compared Felbamate to 15 milligram per kilogram dosing of valproic acid for treating partial complex seizures. And lo and behold, the study looked like it was reasonably well done with a fair number of patients. Uh, and the rates of seizures were lower in the felbamate group than in the valproic acid group. Well, here's the problem with this study design. It was, uh, it, it really, the regimen's choice didn't make sense because while felbamate was intent, was dosed at and intended to uh, be used as a first line therapy for partial complex seizures, valproic acid is not a first line therapy for partial complex seizures. It is a second-line therapy for that. There are known to be better drugs. The valproic acid has better results in generalized seizures, not partial seizures, and in absence seizures, not partial seizures. So they compared it to a second-line drug. They also used a lower dose for valproic. The 15 milligram per kilogram dose of valproic acid is by many clinicians a sub-therapeutic dose. So the comparison they made in in many clinicians' minds, made no sense at all, and why they why it was even uh, allowed to be structured that way was considered problematic. So you always kind of look at these things with a bit of a jaundiced eye. Uh, you also want to look, was it done in a hospital or outpatient? Did they have some way of assessing people took their meds? Was the study conducted long enough for the outcome measured? For example, uh, treatment of depression you often want to make sure that it's done for at least uh, three to six months because some antidepressants don't have their full effect for the second, third, or fourth month uh, into therapy. So you want to make sure it's long enough. And you clearly want it long enough to measure for certain types of adverse effects that may accumulate over time but not be seen in the short course of therapy. And finally, are there other therapies that work? Did you control for other therapies? Particularly one of the most important things is drug interactions. Did, the, did you control for a concurrent drug that could increase or decrease the level? When you're looking at outcomes, does the outcome clinically make sense? Is it a clinically meaningful and significant outcome? Did they assess that method appropriately? Was it objective? 
how many observations did they make, and how were those observations standardized. You also want to look at their result section that's published and make sure it's reported in a clear and a concise way that all the terms are defined. If there are subjective assessments of what, what constituted good, fair, poor response, uh, are the tables and charts clear? One really important issue is to look at how they accounted for every patient who was ultimately entered into the study. And this involves a concept known as intent to treat. So if our original intention was that somebody was first intended to be treated, but for some reason or other they dropped out of the study process even early on, well, if we drop out, the, if, we, if we don't count the folks who dropped out, then that often biases results to make the study look, the drug that you're trying to, uh, to, to showcase look better because you're not accounting for the many people who may have gotten the drug initially but didn't get the response you want, so they dropped out. So the intent to treat is an important consideration, and ethically, it's almost considered unethical in this day and age to not provide intent to treat analysis on the data you've got. Statistically, there are a lot of issues with statistics, and this is not a course in statistics. Our hope is that you've had some fleeting experience with statistics to have some familiarity with it. But the kind of things that you'd want to look at in a study statistically is was the sample size large enough? Was the duration of the trial long enough? Uh, was there adequate follow-up of patients? Did they account for all the data? And is the data appropriate and clearly described? Uh, do they provide you the original data where you could do the statistics yourself with, or are they hiding that? And if you've taken a course in statistics, you probably are familiar with the types of statistical tests that are used, and was it parametric or non-parametric data? Did they apply the right statistical test? Was the population a normal distribution population? And is the data analyzed according to the original protocol? So all of these statistical things, you can say a lot with statistics, and you can manipulate data in all kinds of ways from Sunday to include a result that you really want to achieve. So important that when you're looking at all of these assessments that you're in a position where someone has done a truly appropriate statistical analysis of the data uh, that's presented. You also want to be aware of the, what the p-value means, the intent of a p-value, what a p-value doesn't mean, what the confidence intervals are, uh, and whether they used a single or two-tail t-test if they did that, uh, did they account for all the possible uh, responses. Uh, other statistical issues are whether or not you've done a, a standard error of the mean or a standard deviation, uh, and those are important uh, statistical analysis considerations because some of these statistical applications can make your data look better or worse. You also want to look about the associations that are made between the intervention and the results. Uh, and, uh, and keep in mind that you could make almost any result statistically significant by including enough patients, but it may not be clinically meaningful uh, or clinically significant. So for example, if a drug meets statistical significance of lowering blood pressure, and that it's more effective at lowering blood pressure, but only does it by one millimeter of mercury systolic, then clinically that doesn't mean much at all. So uh, it's important that you are able to differentiate that just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean that it's clinically important. When you assess uh, the methodology, you also want to look at, finally, are the conclusions supported by your data? Are the references up to date? Are there a myriad of different authors from different places that are replicating the same results? Or is everything you're looking at in the reference section by the same author or group of authors, which lends you to think that, gee, if no one else can replicate this data, there is something wrong with it. You always want to look at the funding. Was it independent? If it wasn't, what kind of vested interest did that company have? And how did they uh, uh, control for that potential uh, bias? Uh, was the title and abstract fairly represent the study? All these are important things to look at.
Uh, also, you have to keep in mind is not only the study that you're looking at, you have to ask the question, did other investigators ask these same questions, but they never got published? One of the concerns you've got is that for data that doesn't include some wow result, some really important clinical result, uh, those studies often don't get published. Uh, and so you have to wonder if there were, let's say, you know, there was a study uh, where five times it was done, but it, it didn't result any difference between the drug A and drug B, but a sixth study is done and it does notice a difference. You have to wonder those other five studies, if you never see them because they never get published, you have to just wonder in your mind, has this been replicated by other people? And so the more time that it's been replicated by others, the less likelihood that this is a pure chance kind of phenomenon, that they kept repeating the study until something looked good for them. Okay, the next section of the next set of slides revolve around the concept of pharmacoeconomics. And I really don't want to go into a lot of depth on this, nor do you really need to know that, uh, in this in a lot of depth. Pharmacoeconomics really is a, an area where we look at trying to assess some value to different interventions and comparing values based on something, usually money or cost. You know, what does it cost to treat intervention A versus intervention B? Uh, but the analyses can be fraught with bias based on what kind of assumptions are made in those economic analyses. And so for all of these section in pharmacoeconomics, I'm going to go through this in a more superficial kind of way, even though there are a lot of slides here. You'll see the 747 in the lower left-hand corner of the slides, indicating I want you to have an appreciation for these, but don't get too bogged down in a lot of the detail. Pharmacoeconomics is a way we analyze the cost of drug therapy to a health system, and we look to compare costs and outcomes in some kind of a framework that uh, represent some value. And really when someone is looking to do a cost, benef uh, cost uh, analysis, a pharmacoeconomic analysis of some kind, they're really trying to either justify the cost they're charging for a service or they're looking to compare with this limited resource, is it better for me to, us to spend this resource on a drug or on surgery? We can apply the same principles of pharmacoeconomics from an administration point of view does it make sense for us from a cost point of view to open up a clinic for this group of patients, heart failure patients, or should we open up a antithrombotic clinic? Uh, and what are, the, what are the investments we make in each of those clinics and what kind of outcomes do we get uh, for how much bang for our buck do we get for that intervention? So why we do them is maybe a, uh, the hospital, the HMO wants to know, do we put this drug on the formulary or not? Uh, is, is what's the best drug for an individual patient? How do we compare two or more drugs or services? How do we best spend our finite healthcare dollar? But keep in mind that all of these analyses are wrought with bias. So there are basically five types of pharmacoeconomic analyses. I'm briefly going to go through examples of some of these, uh, but again, they're all pretty much biased based on what values we bring into it and what, what perspective uh, we have in our analysis. So first of all, let's look at cost of minimization. This is the simplest example, and anybody who does grocery shopping uh, is familiar with this concept. We have two interventions that we compare. Now, if we estimate that uh, treatment A is identical to treatment B, that we can consider them interchangeable, then we just look at whatever the cheapest one is and that's what we use. So here we have two brands of atorvastatin. If they're both rated by the Food and Drug Administration as bioequivalent, that their bioavailability is identical, and then in that case the FDA gives it something called an AB rating, then we could use brand A or brand B and which one are we going to pick? In this case, we're going to pick brand A because uh, 100 tablets cost us uh, $10.98, whereas brand B, 100 tablets cost us $75. So that's a pretty basic thing. But the assumption here is that both interventions are identical. 
A cost-benefit analysis is a way to uh, look at, all, uh, assemble all of the benefits in dollars versus all of the costs in dollars, and then whichever one has the most benefit for the least cost is the one that quote unquote wins. So an example, the, uh, the cost measurements in dollars, the outcomes are in dollars, uh, it's difficult sometimes to quantify this, and there's a lot of bias that goes into the value we give, uh, particularly the outcome units, uh, but let's try to do that. So here's an example of, let's say we were looking at uh, an expensive cholesterol lowering drug that we give, uh, and the costs have come down in the last decade or so for some of these, but if we looked at every patient uh, who falls into a particular category, uh, go falling into a, uh, a category of getting statin drugs, maybe it would cost for treating for five years for treating a thousand patients cost us four million dollars because the drug costs so much, we have to do so much lab testing, we have to have so many visits with the doctor, they all add up to four million dollars. But the benefits are that we've uh, avoided deaths, we've avoided heart attacks, we've avoided medical costs and loss income for patients and we've avoided surgery procedures as well, and all those add up to 11 million. So in this case, with the assumptions that are made here, it makes sense to move forward with the cost of the drug and intervention is less than the, the, the benefits we would accrue. Now, as you kind of look through this, you might be asking yourself, well, the patient is concerned about their debts, and how do you even put a dollar value on that, that you're valuing their human life by how much income they made, and that in and of itself is offensive to some people. Uh, so these studies are somewhat limited in how they can even quantify the volume. The other issues are is that who is really, and we'll talk about this in a couple minutes, whose value system of what is the benefit, who cares about these benefits? And the patient cares about the benefits, but the healthcare plan may or may not care about some of these benefits. So we'll talk about those in a little bit. A cost effectiveness analysis compares the drugs uh, in some unit of how much they, uh, how much you get for, uh, for each unit of outcome uh, for that. So an example of this is that the unit outcome might be a 10% reduction in cholesterol. And again, the concerns here is one is you're using a surrogate outcome of cholesterol rather than the risk for heart attacks. But here's the expense of, for a 10% reduction in cholesterol, this was based on data from 20 years ago, so these numbers have changed. But here's an example of the cost for t uh, to reduce ten cholesterol by 10%. Each of these agents at that point in time cost this amount of money. And so in this case, uh, cerevastatin, uh, appears to be the most appropriate agent to pick because it's the most effective for the lowest cost in reducing cholesterol. There's something called a cost utility analysis, and this one also uh, initially might get folks a little uh, ethically squirrely uh, in a sense, and what they do is they try to look at be defining benefits in something called quality adjusted life years. Um, and this is a way to quantify a benefit uh, for a patient and giving them uh, a, a quantity of what they would trade uh, perfect health for that condition for. Let me give an example of that on the next slide. So let's say someone in perfect health, you'd give it a utility score of one and somebody who died a utility store of zero. And somebody, let's say, who ends up on dialysis, we give a 0.58. Well, what we're basically looking at here with this score is that to me, 58% of a year, I will trade perfect health for 58% of a year compared to being on dialysis for a full year. So you ask patients what their value system is. Their quality of life on dialysis is not very good, and so, if you could say a patient, okay, you're going to have, you can go 10 years on dialysis or you can go 5.8 years 
and perfect health and not go on dialysis, and you'll be dead at the end of each of those, which would you want? It's called a standard gamble in a sense. Now, granted, there's going to be different value systems for different people, but these are analyses that are done when they question hundreds of people with a particular health condition to determine the value they would trade perfect health for. I'd trade three months of perfect health for a year of living with this condition, and then that would be a value of 0.25, three months to a year, uh, if you get the gist of it. You then apply that quality of life index, the quality, to the interventions and the life expectancy associated with each of those interventions. And so, for example, this is a reasonable thing to consider applying to uh, two different courses of chemotherapy. Let's say chemotherapy treatment A has a longer life expectancy, but a lot of adverse effects and people have a poor quality of life compared to a cheaper chemotherapy that doesn't, people don't live as long with three and a half years, but have a better quality of life, less side effects associated with it. Here, the comparison, if you were to look at this, is that the quality adjusted life years is 2.7 years for treatment A and 2.5 years for treatment B, kind of edging toward going with treatment A based on the quality adjusted life years. There, you will occasionally find studies that are defined this way. Clinically, though, many clinicians could care less about this kind of data, with the one exception is that this way of thinking is an important way of thinking when you're talking about and trying to get to the basis of what your patient wants. When you're trying to quantify with your patient about intervention A or intervention B, do I go with dialysis or do I go with uh, hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis? Do I go with another round of chemo or do I decide to stop chemo? What's the value to the patient? There's going to be variation in what somebody's utility of continuing or not is how much they can tolerate, what their individual value system is. And what this kind of study methodology tries to get around is to recognize that different patients have different values for what's important. Uh, there's finally a decision analysis, uh, and this is basically similar to other methods, but all you do is you add up all of the potential costs associated with treatment A versus treatment B. Uh, and you kind of lay out the lay of the land. So, for example, let's look at two different treatments for treating a urinary tract infection where treatment A is cheaper at $10 uh, per dose uh, for four days, twice a day for four days, uh, as effective rate is 85% versus treatment B is a 95% effectiveness rate uh, but at a higher drug acquisition cost. So if you look at 1,000 patients with treatment A, 850, all you have to pay for is the drug. But for those that weren't effective, the 150 that weren't effective, some of those had to be hospitalized and also get physician visits. It ends up being, if you add all those costs in and divide it by the 1,000 patients you treated, it's $164 a case, where the more expensive drug B costs more to outlay for the drug, but the problem is that you have, or the benefit is that you have less hospitalization, less complications, uh, and so you don't have to pay for those complications. And so the decision analysis tries to look at what the reported efficacy of a particular uh, drug is compared to another drug, and then to look at all of summarizing all those costs. So in practice, uh, typically what you're going to look at, no matter what the decision is here, if uh, all other things being equal, if the, if the drug is safe and effective, you're going to go with the cheapest choice. If the drug is less safe or less effective, you're not going to use that drug no matter what it costs. In between are the points of whether or not it's uh, equally effective but costs more or less or, you know, these variables, there are going to be comparisons you're going to make when the treatment is better but it costs more or the treatment is worse, but it's lower cost, what is, how do you quantify that difference and make a decision? Important when you're looking at any of these pharmacoeconomic analyses is what's the perspective? Is it by the perspective of the patient, the physician, the institution, the employer, uh, 
whoever's paying, maybe the HMO, society, government, who's looking at those numbers? Let's look back at our example from a society, society perspective or patient's perspective, that comparison earlier on between atorvastatin, 80 milligrams a day, uh, and what it costs. And in this, um, this fictitious analysis, it looked like from this perspective where we counted all those benefits of, of the drug therapy that the benefit, it made sense for us to go with the drug therapy. From an HMO's perspective though, they could make the argument that uh, in fact, we're not gonna count lost income for patients. We're not gonna cost, uh, we're gonna only look at what it costs us. And our costs are our inpatient treatments for an MI and our inpatient cabbage surgeries. And so uh, if that's all we're looking at for the costs of the benefits that we're avoiding, it costs more to do it, we shouldn't do this. You could even make a more cynical argument is that if the HMO knows that their patients turn around every three years, that they're not gonna have the patient now. And what we see with statins is we're preventing an event five, 10, 20 years down the road, they're gonna be on another plan by then. And so for us, we're only gonna look at the things we avoid in the first three years and it's even a more compelling issue in a three-year analysis that the benefits are quite minimal from this limited perspective. So keep in mind, not so much that you're gonna probably look at a lot of pharmacoeconomic analyses, but if you're looking at how they summarize costs and benefits, look at the kind of assumptions they make from whose perspective they're making them, how they value those or quantify those benefits and to what extent is that ethical or, or, or appropriate or not appropriate, depending on the kind of question you've got. So we're gonna look at a lot of questions about these, but probably the most important of all of these questions asked in pharmacoeconomic analyses is the perspective of the analysis, as well as all of these other kinds of questions that were similar to other studies. So let's go back to the larger question, whether it's pharmacoeconomic studies or other studies that are published, the, there's really the bottom line is, so what? What's the big issue? Is it a clinically important result? And was their methodology sound? Was it plausible? Can you generalize those results to the patient in front of you? So if you're, for example, looking at data for that's all done with adults and you've got a pediatric patient in front of you, you probably can't generalize those results to your patient. Is it practical? Uh, and are you able to differentiate what's statistically versus what's clinically significant? Pretty much the bottom line in practice, and this is true also for applying literature, is the things that we as clinicians are responsible for is to make sure our interventions are safe and they're effective. You want to know, are they safe short-term and long-term? Maybe the study hasn't been done long-term. You don't really know what the long-term risks are. And even the short-term risks were limited by 3,000 patients or whatever that have ever been studied, this has ever been studied. Is the therapy you're looking at effective, both in the short-term and the long-term? So if an intervention is both safe and effective, and compared to everything else that you can do for this patient, this is the safest choice and or the more effective the most effective choice you can do, then that pretty much answers your question. If, however, you've got two interventions that are equally safe and equally effective, then it comes down to asking the cost question. And then you can look at what are the drug costs, what are the non-drug costs, and how practical it is it for a patient to adhere to this regimen. So we only really look at costs of drug therapy when we have two relatively equal interventions. When there's an intervention that far is far safer and or far more effective, then that usually trumps everything else. Now the safety question, sometimes you get in a dilemma that you have an intervention that's far more effective, but there's more safety concerns with it. Then you've got to weigh the, the disease state of the patient is it, is it appropriate for us that we won't have a lot of disease progression? And so let's start with the less effective intervention first because by delaying the more effective intervention, we're not really harming the patient 
or by delaying the more effective intervention, would we be harming the patient? All of those important considerations. But if they're relatively equal in safety and effectiveness profiles from treatment A or treatment B, then go with the least cost, costly intervention. But keep in mind, it's not just drug cost. It might be, depending on other factors, there might be other costs associated with it as well. When you're in a position to try to find information, you know, uh, you might need to go to the original literature, but most of the time you're going to go to secondary references. The primary sources, the original studies, the advantage is that you get that original data, you can pour over it, but it may only be helpful, that original primary study may only be helpful if you can generalize the results of that inclusion exclusion criteria to your patient. It may be a very specific question that does address your question, or it might not be. The secondary sources, either a larger meta-analyses or what's published in other references based on original data, those, those guidelines, whatever, those are much more practical in most cases to at least get you off the ground to decide what your, uh, what your interventions ought to be. Uh, you also want to look to make sure that whatever sources you're looking at, their funding sources are independent, uh, they're unbiased, and so uh, FDA.gov is. But in clinical arenas where you practice, one of the uh, drug information services that are uh, available to you in your practice settings, the two that are most commonly used in the United States, are Micromedics or UpToDate. Both of those really have a very good track record for being providing up-to-date information that is accurate and not biased. If you look at a drug company's website, uh, if you're just looking at the package insert, the package insert has to get approved, every word of it has to get approved by the FDA. So the package insert may provide you less biased information than what you might see uh, in a other, other marketing information from a drug company. You just need to be kind of aware of the limitations of uh, when somebody's trying to sell you something that, that that data might be, in a sense, biased. So the references I'd encourage you to sort of look at in your practice is uh, the FDA is a reasonable, good website. Two of the ones that we use a lot in clinical practice, they're subscription services, but when you work in a healthcare setting, they subscribe to those, are Micromedics or UpToDate, but there are many others around. And I encourage you to work with your fellow students and colleagues to figure out what references really work for them. Uh, there are multiple other ones, uh, one's called Hippocrates, that's reasonable uh, and it's available. A lot of these are also available not only on the computer, but they have applications for your mobile device as well that you can use on the fly in practice. Okay, very good.